So we can just press the broadcast button and bring everyone else in as well. And we're sort of 60 seconds early, but sure, that doesn't matter too much, does it? Everyone will come on in and say hello. Sean, I never asked you, do you sing, by the way? Yeah, hey, wait a minute. So you've been talking to somebody? Yeah, I've been talking to you. <laughs> I've been talking to Facebook and Zuck and talking to you and everyone's joining us now. We're a little bit early, so we've, we've 60 seconds to kill before everyone gets in. So have you... <laughs> oh, no. have you that's, what I, that's why I asked you, like... Like, actually, I have singing in my past, and I was wondering, like, who you been talking to? Asking me if I sing. Like, did somebody tell you I sing? <laughs> well, you see, nobody has told me that. But there you go. You learn something new every day, eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, praise and worship leader. You belong. So, we're, we're all these panels, and we're waiting. Sometimes Zuck doesn't let us into Facebook, so there's a little bit of a delay and stuff. So, I always ask, does anyone sing or tell a joke? You know, so you're the first person to say, yeah, I can sing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You put me on the spot now. You know what I mean? He's so real, real in my soul today. He has washed all of my sins away. For Jesus' love just bubbles over in my soul. There you go. There you go. That's the yeah, first time yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. Well done. First time that we've had someone sing on the think tank. Really? Yeah, that's that's yeah. all you're gonna get though. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, man. Rock that. So that's Sean, awesome. yeah. we're, we're we're here to talk about a subject because we met what, about three years ago for the first time, I think, down in New Orleans. Yeah. Also down in Louisiana, and we were both yeah. speaking at an event down there. And I went to your, your talk and I was fascinated by your story and your knowledge and what you've done in business. And we had lunch together. You bought, us, bought me lunch. I wanted to buy you lunch and you insisted on buying myself and Susan and Merlin their lunches. Yes. Um, and and, and it, it, was, it, was, it was, you're such a kind hearted man. Like you really are. You're, you're one of those special individuals as far as I'm concerned. But you know your purpose and you know your passion. You know what you're, what, what you're here to do on this planet. Um, so what I'd like to, but one of the stories you gave me was, I want to go back in time. So I want to go back in time when you were working in Detroit before you were a full-time photographer, because something happened in Detroit that hadn't really happened before in our lifetimes, right? That is, that is the truth. Uh, before I was a photographer and I've been a photographer full-time for about 16 years. Um, <clears throat> I was, I was working in warehousing, man, uh, logistics. I drove a forklift truck, uh, shipping and receiving. I unloaded trucks. We filled uh, orders from warehouses for, uh, for companies and businesses and all of that kind of stuff. And that was my life. Um, dude, and I had two jobs. I had two great jobs at the same time. I worked one during the day um, and another at night, and I was making great money um, doing warehousing. And photography was just a thought, a hobby right um then so yeah man that was that was it and what happened detroit for those who, who don't who aren't familiar with the backstory so you you know when the housing market and all of that stuff started to tank and started to crash um there were signs of it before it actually happened in um 2007 2008 right there were signs of business slowing down um and so you know our we, we are the automotive industry. And so, you know, when, when car companies fail, um, people here, man, in Michigan, you could, you could uh, graduate high school and go to a car plant and make $100,000 a year, right? And so you had people uh, living middle class off of working in um, the car industry here. Well, when the housing market crashed, when we went into, but right before we went into the Great Recession, stuff started closing down. And you literally had a ton of people upside down in their homes when the car, when the, when the um, car industry crashes. People don't have money. They don't have education to transcend and, and, and retool, right? And so as a result, a lot of people left. They left underwater in their homes. And we were in a financial crisis. And so we are blue-collar town. We are hard workers. And we hadn't taken the time to uh, retool right? And, and have new skill sets. So we took a big hit. Um, and as a result of that, following a lot of all of that stuff, and along with bad leadership, Detroit, uh, we had the makings of Detroit going into bankruptcy, um, which is ultimately 
you know, what happened. I actually got laid. The reason I am a photographer today is because of the two great warehousing jobs that I had at the same time. I got laid off of both within four months of each other. Okay. So, you know, the best advice any mentor has ever given me is, Ronan, if you're in a situation that you haven't been in before, find someone who has been there because you can learn so much from their experience. So, you know, this Corona, COVID, you know, it's been a lever for everyone as well. And it's nearly like, it's nearly like that scenario, right? Where we, you know, we're going to have a recession out of this. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're already in recession, as the economists say. Um, and we're going to have to rebuild. And, and you had to do that in Detroit, yeah? When, when, when that happened, you lost your two jobs, no income, and you had to start again and rebuild your business. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and, you know, the choices you had? I think you said to me before, Ron, I had no choice. Right? I had no choices. It was, you know, I fit no model in photography. So um, back then, the, the standard photography model was, would, to be, would be able to open up a brick and mortar store, right? There was, there was no model that says um, do photography from online or go seek out uh, clients and customers, right? It was brick and mortar store. It was beautiful furniture. It was project uh, images up on the screen. It was self framing, um, all of that stuff. Well, that wasn't my situation. I couldn't do that. Not only that, um, as a man of color, I was I was a, a very little unknown in photography industry, right? People didn't go to typically people of color, not because they felt some kind of way or there was an ism. It was just, we just weren't there in a professional world where um, we had skill set to go after big budget um, clients. And so from that standpoint, I had to have an attitude of, I'm either going to build something new that's never been created before. And I had to have the, the attitude that failure is just not an option because I didn't have many choices, right? So I could go through finding another job um, that would make little, very little money or I could take this camera and this education that I have and I can try and make something uh, work. And so that started the process of innovation and innovating process. So, and I think what you're saying to me is that um, a lot of this is about mindset. Is that what you're telling me? That, you know, you have to adopt a certain mindset to be strong in those scenarios and to figure out what you can create. So you created a whole new business, right? You were, you were in warehousing with two great high paying jobs. You lose that. And you had some, had you some photographic skills at that stage? So or? a little bit. I had taken some classes, right? I had a Canon digital rebel. One of the first ones that came out, it was a hobby. Um, and, and back to what you said with Corona. Yes, it is an absolute mindset. So if you, when you look at Corona, anybody's talking about going into business and they look at their market disappear. Right. Um, and you can get, you can tend to get frustrated or even feel like you want to die inside because you're looking like, Oh my God, my only source of income has disappeared. It's gone. Um, there is this attitude in you that, that, that has to be there before you do anything that has to be there that says failure is just not an option and it will cause you to start to look, um, at different things. So yes, it was a hobby for me. I had a Canon Digital Rebel, Ronan. Um, I had taken a class here, maybe. I think I had taken a fundamentals class. Um, and I made the decision, and, and it was a bold decision. Um, I made the decision to say, you know what? I'm gonna launch off into this. I don't know what it's gonna look like, um, but my options are few, and why not take a chance on myself? So, so you had the first ingredient, yeah, which was mindset belief in yourself and you had the need yeah necessity is the is is the main driver of innovation right Absolutely. so you had no choice there you had to make this happen had to. so 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 what was the what did you do next so you, you had the right mindset and you knew you had to do something and you knew that you knew a certain amount of photography but had to learn more learn more what, what was the next step in that journey for you? so need is Need is what is innovate. So a lot of people approach photography from the standpoint, oh, it's a hobby. I love to do it. Let me start a business doing it. I started it from the standpoint of I have to make money, right? So I can get a job or I can do photography. So I had to make money. That was my motivation. Next steps was is that I completely had to look at photography, not as an art form, but as a business, right? 
Um, it had to make money. I love photography, love the artistic sense of it, right? But it had to make money. And so from that mindset, being in the position that we were um, in Detroit, a shoot here and a session there was not going to be enough for me to be able to take care of my home. So what I started to do was I started to look at photography in a way that could make money for me. In other words, what genres and what markets of photography are automatic? So I started to look at school photography. And at the time, statistics said it was a national 80% buy rate. So if you are a school photographer, what this said was is that if you're a school photographer and you go into a school of a thousand kids, what that said is that 80% of those kids are gonna buy school packages, right? Um, that's 800 kids. The national average at the time was $24. So it said to me that give or take, 800 kids would buy a, a package at $24, which means that I could walk into a school at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning with no money in my pocket. And by three o'clock, by the end of the day, I could potentially have $19,600 in my pocket. That was extremely attractive, right? I don't like photographing children. I don't, that's not who I am, but I became a school photographer. Right. And so looking at it from a business sense and being able to take care of home, school photography made sense. It was automatic. You didn't have to do much advertising. You didn't have to spend money on marketing. If you got one school, it did great. And if you delivered, oh, my goodness, the relationship. And if you take that and add to it two schools, three schools, four schools. Right. Um, my situation began to 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 uh, quickly turn around financially. Right. So what you're saying to me is that you had to make a business out of it. You identified the clients that you could be probably most successful with early that would deliver the financial result that you needed then. But how, like people say to me, the schools market's a closed market, you know? There's big, big, big companies that nearly secure contracts for years and years and years. How did you go about getting that well, first? They told me the same thing. You know what I did? I ignored what I heard. Um, I went in, you know what I found out is that schools are based on relationships. And, and who runs schools, right, are not, who runs the school photography program is not typically um, the district, right? Uh, in some cases it is, or the principal. There are parent organizations that run the school photography program. It is, a, it is the school secretary in the front office um, who makes those types of decisions, right? And so what I would do is that I would go in with chocolates, donuts, whatever. I'd have my, uh, my packet uh, ready to hand to them. You know what I would say? I would say, listen, I know you all got a school photographer already, and I am not interested in messing up any relationships that are already established. I says, but if by any reason something might change, please give me a call, right? And so it left an impression. And no, and even if I didn't get the business that year, um, the following year, oftentimes, uh, the, the big box stores would mess up. Somebody would make a mistake, and they would call me. And you know what I found out is that if you make sure that the secretary is taken care of and the parent organization, um, you make sure they're happy, you can have long-term relationships in school photography. And that's how I broke in. Very good. And then you decided that, I know you have a beautiful studio now, now but uh, you didn't go straight from school photography to having a studio as well, right? It was a process, no. another process for you. Can you just Absolutely. tell us how you approached that and what you did there? Well, I, I, I didn't have a studio, but I rented time um, at a studio. And so, you know, backdrops are expensive. I didn't have a lot of budget. So even though I just started school photography um, and it would make money, it was, I was learning. It was a learning curve. So it was a lot of work. I made a lot of mistakes, right? And so a lot of those mistakes had to be paid for with the money that I made initially, right? Um, I'm just learning. And so uh, renting time, I wasn't a big box store. I couldn't attract schools like that. So what I had to do was give an experience, right? Um, I didn't have money to buy $700 uh, 10 by 20 backdrops. Neither did I have space to store them, right? Space or time to store them. So I came up and innovated a process that centered around an experience for high school seniors, right? Um, I shot on white, black or gray, 
you know, and I, I focused on expressions and I used skill sets like using depth of field to make shots very cool. Uh, I would provide uh, snacks and soda and favorite drinks. I would allow them to patch into the system, play their music. And so it became less about a pose and a photograph and it became more about the experience that they had, right? And at the top of it, right, once that was all said and done, they still had great imagery um, and they had a hard time choosing. And people wanted to give me their money. Folks say I talk a lot, right? I'm not a salesman. So I had to make it hot, right? I, I hate selling. If you can believe that, Ronan, I hate selling, right? So I had to make the imagery hot. And I had to make it so parents wanted to buy everything. And so, 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 and I also know that you spent an awful lot of money on props, right? Yes. No, no, no money on props. So you know what, do you know what high school kids love? High school kids love their stuff. They love their iPhones. They love their Beats headphones. They love their Cartier glasses. They love their ripped jeans. They love their Air Jordans. They love their trophies. They love all of their fashion. It didn't make sense for me to buy props. They have their own props. So you have them bring their props in, right? And when you're done with the session, guess what happens? This magical thing happens. They take them back home with them. And what's really cool about that is that um, families are more likely to buy images that feature their things. The things that memories are bonded to and the things that bring families together um, and things that identify uh, a person's or a senior's high school career, those things, those tangible little things, doesn't have to be worth nothing. They tend to buy more because of what it means. Okay, so this is why I think this was ingenious, right? Mm -hmm. You hadn't got money to spend on props, so it got you thinking about, so how can I do this another way? And you said, you know what? What really matters is what my client feels attached to. Mm -hmm. Whether that be a person or whether it be uh, something that they like in music or whatever that is. And we've a couple of images we've shown in a minute just to express that. But you also then looked at your style and you said, what can really look really cool where I don't have to spend a fortune on backgrounds and stuff? Mm -hmm. And you said, my first step can't be, I can't afford a studio from the start. So I have to build up to that so I can, I, I may have to rent time and stuff. So that was in, that's a real business brain, you know, thinking through the process. Because mm -hmm. a lot of photographers, you know, tell me, and when I meet them, you know, they're right brains. They, they're more creative and it's about the art. And sometimes the whole business of photography is forgotten. But I'd love to, you, you have a great saying about, you know, the importance of client interaction. So with your permission, I'm going to just call up a few shots sure. just to tell the story because, you know, a picture is a thousand, thousand words, right? Even when it's you speaking, Sean, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just do this and see what happens. Very cool. Okay. Now, I think... Oops. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Yes, we can see the image. Excellent. So, Sean, I've heard this story before, right? So I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but I think it's an amazing story. Tell us the story behind this. Well, this, this is was done. Oh, this is cool. So, so this was done. Um, calendar um, actually picked this up, but this is a kid who was getting ready to go off to college, very astute, um, in the studio with granddad, right? And so you had all these people um, in the studio, family and whatnot, and uh, had this idea because the kid was very astute, um, is that we had, we had them switch roles, right? Um, and and in, the, in the calendar, they called it generations, but we had them switch roles and we had um, the high school student, the, the guys get ready to graduate high school. We, I had a Time Magazine in the studio. Um, we had them put on glasses and we, and we put the iPhone and the headphones on granddad. And we had granddad rock out like, hey, what's up? You know what I mean? Uh, we get ready to do our thing. And we had the, the grandson look at granddad like, grandfather, please, please get it together, right? And what it was was a juxtaposition of their relationship. It was fun. Um, and it, it really defined, if not in a fun kind of way, um, the love in their relationship, right? And this is what this is what people react to. So from a business standpoint, let's look at it like this. Creatively, um, the family and everybody loved this shot. But from a business standpoint, people will purchase what they emotionally connect to, 
right? And that was the point in building business the way I built business and building the experience the way I built it is because people connect with experiences and with memories. And when you do that, people will, money, money becomes not an object right? Negotiation goes out the window and it becomes something that they have to have and want because, because it, it is important to, to them and who they are. And that's and what we did with this shot. And I know that you and your sales process, right? You have a, you've a pretty clever pre-shoot consultation chat to determine exactly what you need them to bring with them to create imagery and connections like this, right? Absolutely. I think every person, I think every photographer out there, and then if you're in business period, especially at a time like this um, with coronavirus where people are not spending money. And let me say this, um, let me say this. I, I need to preface it with saying this. It's not that people don't have money. It just becomes harder to get it out of their pocket. And so it, it, it becomes our responsibility as business owners to find a way um, to get money out of people's pockets, right? And have them give it to you. You have to be able to solve problems that way. And so what we do with every single client is we get to know who they are and we consult with them, right? It's not a difficult thing to do. It is literally a, a 15 minute, 20 minute, either conversation on the phone or we bring them into the studio and we have a conversation about what they are passionate about, what excites them, what their favorite colors are, right? Show me all of that stuff and I want you to bring it all for the session. Bring everything you got. And it's not just about the props that they bring, Sean. You encourage them to bring their whole family, right? Absolutely. We, um, we, because it's an experience, right? Um, we patch their, their music through the system. We'll have grandma and aunties and godparents um, in there. I, like I told you, I have water and soda and vegetables, if, if vegetable tray if that's what they want, right? Or we'll have pizza if that's what they want. And it becomes an entire experience. And not only that, I shoot tethered on a screen. So as I'm shooting, the imagery comes up on the screen. And there have been many a time where a grandmother and a mom have stood by that big screen television and tears have flowed down their faces when they saw the imagery come up, right? Because this is their high school senior that's getting ready to go off to college. And I think, I think the next stories might be a story around that. I think when I saw this presentation before with you back in, in New Orleans, that that's what happened here. Mom cried. Oh, right? goodness. So, so you want me to tell this story? Yes, please. I'm not ready for it, Ronnie. Rock that. So this kid, this kid, mom was getting, mom was paying for his high school senior photos. And this kid, um, he, at the last minute, he decided that he was grown, right? Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not cheap, Ronan. You know what I mean? So she's a single mother and she was paying for his high school senior photos. And they came in the day of the session and his hair was just like that. Now, mom wanted him to have a haircut. Mom wanted his hair cut low. She wanted it nice. She wanted it neat. And they came through the door arguing. And he was like, no, ma, this is my hair. I don't want to cut my hair. This is how I want my hair. And she was like, boy, I'm paying all this money for these photos. I wanted you to cut your hair. They were literally, they were angry. I didn't think we would be able to do the shoot that day, right? Um, it was the nature of their relationship. So what I did was, is he had a pick. I put them on the scene and I had them act out some stuff. I said, mom, I know you mad about his hair. I said, this is what I need you to do. We involved family in the sessions and I do that, right? Um, I said, I need you to pick his head. I need you to grab him by the neck and I need you to act like you get ready to pick his head. And I told him, I said, listen, I need you to look like it hurts, right? Um, and so that's what we did. And as soon as we did that, um, it was amazing. Do you you had a do you had a next picture? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Show them the next one. This is what happened. It literally broke the ice, right? Um, and they started laughing and having a great time, and it was an amazing, amazing session. But you know what, Ronan? This was the definition of who they were. This was them throughout his high school career. They were always butting heads, right? And so. Um, it defined kind of who they were. This was grandma, grandma and mom in there. And, and this is them like, boy, we getting tired of talking to you and grandma grabbing him by the hair. Right. Um, and if you go to the next picture, you will see 
sort of the happiness um, from it. And so what ended up happening was, is that all of these photos went into his gallery, went into his album because it defined who they were as a family. Um, they bought up everything, right? And, and what I love, Sean, is that, you know, one is you involve the whole family. So what does that do? Not only does it allow you to capture the emotion in those relationships in special ways, and we've seen two examples of that, but it also gives opportunity to sell to grandma as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, grandma, grandma is probably the one behind the scenes saying, listen, you get all of that. I, I don't, you, mm -mm, I want all of it. I want all of them, right? Where maybe they weren't thinking about it before because she's a single mom. And, and here's the thing you, are, you need to know is that most, when single mothers come to me, they understand how much I cost, but they come with a budget and they say, Sean, listen here, this is, this is what you cost, that's fine. I want this, this is all I'm spending, right? But when you, when you capture who they are, it throws budget out the window and they start finding ways um, to come up with income to make stuff happen. Now you gotta remember, this is around the time where you know Detroit's going through bankruptcy. And so it, it, it taught me that it, it's never about money. It's all about value, you know? And if you can create great value, money will never be an issue, even in tough times. And I also know that you have this motto that it, it has, you have to become more than just a photographer, right? Absolutely. So we're going to get into that segment of the conversation now. So because you, you managed to, for me to figure out a way to connect with your community in a really important way. And you, you didn't actually have a strategy as to where that was going to end up, mm -hmm. but you knew that it was an important thing to do. And it was actually your heart that brought you there first. But just, we're going to have a look now at some stories around that as to how you got involved and what it actually led to is absolutely fascinating, inspiring, and the wisdom in there that we can learn that if we all get involved in our community, what it can lead to. So can you just talk for a minute while I call up the slides about what it means to you first to become more than just a photographer? Oh, absolutely. Um, becoming more than just a photographer. You know, I say more than just a photographer because is when, you know, in Detroit, people look at you as just a picture man. Oh, all I need is some pictures, right? You're just a photographer. Um, becoming more than that means being engaged and being involved in society because it's just important to, right? I remember... Um, as a kid, um, being taken care of by neighbors when we didn't have enough, right? And so that kind of stuff always stuck with me. And it, I just wanted to be of benefit to my community and my society. So becoming more than just a photographer means I, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to help where I can because it's just important to love people, you know? Um, well, and that's tell, us what then. T tell us the story about the photographic bus tour? So um, I started an organization called IC Detroit and it was around the time that we were, um, we, it was either shortly before or we had, we were just entered into um, talks of bankruptcy and we were, the morale was low, right? And there was not much investment. School systems were failing. Um, first things they were taking out of the schools were art. You know what I mean? So I, I asked myself a question. I said, what are the ways that I can invest in my community while doing the thing that I love, which was photography. And I'd taken this photograph of Woodward Avenue, um, which is a main thoroughfare here in Detroit. And it had won the Spirit of Detroit Award and it was on exhibit in London and it had won an award and it was cool. I was like, okay, cool, Sean, you won an international award. Okay, what now? What do you do with that? And so I started this thing called the IC Detroit Tour where we would walk um, the highlights of uh, downtown Detroit. And we had a tour guide give us the history while we photographed it. I'd do a quick class on composition and we'd go through Detroit and do our thing. Well, that turned into an IC Detroit bus tour where we used all things Detroit. So Andy Diderosi of uh, Detroit Bus Company uh, had these buses. They painted murals on them, put Wi-Fi on them. We used them. We used Detroit stuff like Better Made Chips, Fago Pop, which are all Detroit um, Detroit uh, um, foundational um, type things and products here in Detroit. And uh, we would go on tours. And so I, I reached out to school districts and we wanted to bring kids along, um, which was cool. So we brought kids along. We taught them photography. Um, we were allowed to go through some historical districts in Detroit. We brought on city council people as touch points to them. And it was a way to impact the city 
while doing photography and having a little bit of fun. So, right. so for me, Sean, what, what this said to me is and when I sort of delve into it, because I'm one of those people who says, okay, so what was the process here and what was the end result? And for me, the process started with your purpose, right? In that you were proud of your city. You were proud of where you came from. Yes, you sure. could see that morale was low and people were struggling because of what was going on economically. And, and when, when Detroit was in the mess, it was in financially. And you said, I'm going to do something here to help people. I'm going to do something here to help people learn a skill one, i.e. I can help them be better at photography if that's what they love. But also you're going to create a community and a sense of, um, a sense of being proud about where you live and yeah. where you're from, right? Yes, yes. The, and, and so this totally wasn't the intention. The intention was just to give back. But what I found out was is that in giving back, there also is a business resonance or foundation to that. What, what, what you end up serving is, is that everybody in Detroit loves, um, loves the success of youth, right? And they love Detroit, right? And so me combining those had this effect that as opposed to being just a photographer, I became this advocate for youth success, right? That also featured the city of Detroit. It was just a cool thing that kids benefited from. And what, what, I, what I ended up noticing that is that people want to do business with people that they like and that they trust, right? Um, and that's what started to happen is I started to get business just from authentically loving my city. Because if I'm in Detroit and there's a photographer like Sean Lee who has helped my child, teenager, you know, who am I going to pick for my senior high school photographs? You know, it's, and that's not the reason why you did it, that's but not, that's what the end result, right? That's, that, that is correct, right? You become, for people who, um, and these are the kids that we, uh, um, these are the kids that we taught in the historical district and you see the cameras and all of that stuff. Um, but not, not only that, like from, from a high school senior standpoint, but people who don't care anything about photography love the city of Detroit. So in any way, shape, or form, you attach yourself to helping the city of Detroit while helping um, youth, right, who are um, in and from the city. You have a place in their heart. And whatever it is that they are a part of, they make sure they engage you and involve you. So whatever uh, community they're a part of, whatever company that they are a part of, I was the guy that they were recommending, right, for whatever photographic or uh, visual project. Um, that that they had going on had that that was not the intent, but that was certainly um, what happened as a result. So, so I think what you're saying to me, if I'm a photographer in a community, and you know we're all going to have to you know survive and rebuild our businesses before we can thrive again, is you would say whatever your heart is, whatever really means a lot to you, what your purpose is try and identify in your community where you can deliver on that purpose because absolutely. it will help you absolutely bounce out of recession because it will lead to opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Absolutely. You- absolutely. From a business standpoint, I think that um, photographers should. You, they should actually lead the events. They should actually innovate, lead the events, and authentically do it. Um, it will certainly lead to more business. Because it led to this, right? Absolutely. So... Uh, because of the morale of Detroit was low, um, got together with some um, with some great people um, and did Detroit Week. Um, and we just did Detroit's largest selfie. And whether you love it or whether you hate it, everybody knows about a selfie. And something weird happened, man, on the steps of uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, which is our uh, main museum in Detroit. They wanted to liquidate it, right? Because the city owed all of this money and creditors were trying to come after it and they wanted to liquidate our museum. And we were like, Mm-mm, don't you touch our museum. And so there was a deal made with the DIA and we did Detroit's largest selfie on the steps and something amazing happened. Um, every local news outlet, radio outlet came out for something as simple as the idea of a selfie. Um, and I think that week Ellen had done something on selfies because she was hosting the Oscars and for what it took off. 
Um, and so I was the official photographer for Detroit Week, um, where we had the uh, the largest we had the we had the largest selfie. We had all these people on the steps. We had um, news stations. If you look in there, you see Channel Four and Channel Seven is in there. Um, uh, you see radio stations and reporters are all in this selfie um, that took off. And that week, I think we touched uh, fifteen hundred people that week and had uh, over eight million. Um, online views, um, and it had a it had a reach, um, including Good Morning America, right? And something as simple as that. Now it didn't cost much money. I think it cost two hundred and fifty dollars to have the signs made, and an innovative idea, right? A way to boost the morale of a city um, that's going down. And, and at that time, everybody was making jokes about Detroit, but we love our city, and so this led to. A bunch of other stuff, right? That opened up some very innovative doors and some really cool stuff for me along the way, right? That's the, look, yeah. like eight point two million online reach, you know, yeah. for like we t we talk about like we teach in our business, you know, how photographers can move their marketing online and do all their marketing online, you know, to get that reach for two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, yeah. because of your purpose, that that's just unbelievable PR. Yeah. And, and that's not why you did it. That's not the point. The point I'm trying to make is if you truly believe in something, your passion will come true and you will inspire others to get involved in things like this. And the end result is that it builds your brand and builds your awareness within your community. And that will help your business. And you don't do it for that reason, but that's the end result. Absolutely. Well, we, you know, you, we're talking about, you know, Ronan, we're talking about getting down and dirty. Right. And, and when things, when things get lean, right, you, you can't, maybe you have to throw off the nice dress shoes and you got to put some work boots on, right. Um, and get busy. And, and there is no other thing that will bring people together, like, like reaching a hand down and pulling somebody up with you. And when you do that, once you pull them up, you're there together. Right. You know what I mean? And what have, what I found is that people tend to look out for you. Um, things you don't ask for, things you don't even intend on. People know that you were there when times were bad and they will look out for you um, through the bad times. And then when times get good, you're their guy or their gal, right? Um, and that's what, that's what this was, man. Well, I know when we started the think tank coming in when, when COVID-19 broke first, you know, and I had made great friends like you and others across the industry, you know, and I, I just sent you guys a message and said, I want to do this to try and help the industry. And everyone came on board and everyone knew there was no money in this. It was about giving back to photographers because we knew that we we're going to face difficult times. And we said, no, we have a purpose here. We want to help photographers to survive, rebuild our business and thrive again. But one of the things that you just mentioned there about, you know, and we were really speedy and scrappy, you know, we really were because we had no budget for it. It was just basically, we had some time to try and make this thing happen. And, but one of the things in the, that we learn in Profit First is it's Parkinson's law. You know, it, it is, if you've got a budget, and I've given teams in my business a budget of 10 grand to get something done in two weeks. Guess how much it costs? 10 grand in two weeks. You know, I've given them budgets of five grand in two days to do something similar. Guess how long it takes? Two days and they spend five grand. You know, and it's that principle too. You know, you can, budget is never an excuse. It's just not an excuse because you'll spend whatever is there, but you will become more innovative if you actually have less to spend and you have no choice but to be speedy and make it happen. That's right. So that's amazing. So, so it went somewhere else. You, know, not, you didn't ever dream that this was going to happen, but talk to us about what happened next. So um, the, the, the largest selfie led to, you know, with all the coverage that it got locally, it led to opportunities that I hadn't dreamed of, right? So um, it, it opened up opportunity on a city level, right? And so Motor City matches the mayor of Detroit's, um, it's his program, federally funded program to bring, to bring business back to Detroit, right? So here's another program that, that because we had gone through bankruptcy, we're trying to rebuild. And so it links up building owners with business owners um, and gives grant funding so building owners can fix up their buildings and so business owners can rent those and lease those buildings to open up their businesses. It's called Motor City Match, right? And so um, $500,000 every quarter, 
is what is what the city was giving away. I was the official photographer. And so for every winter, it was my job to photograph the businesses that and against the buildings, right? And the places that were going to be revamped um, and renovated for them to take over. And that was my job. So it was really cool in that I had a chance to meet new budding small business owners, right? And encourage them. I took their photos. We got hype. I congratulated them. And I, bec- and I was the official photographer for Motor City Match. And I was connected. I had a chance to be connected now to the mayor of the city of Detroit. And that's him standing in the middle of the photograph with um, the annual winners, right? Or semi-annual winners. And they had, they called them rounds. And so there was a round of winners every quarter, you know what I mean? And so, man, I, I photographed, I think the first 400, 350 to 400 businesses um, that were a part of the program. So, Sean, like they're talking about it in Ireland, they're talking about it in Europe, I see it in America, I see it in the UK, I see it everywhere where, you know, the governments are trying to figure out right now and, and, and the central banks and, you know, the Fed are trying to do it. You know, how do we restart business and how do we? And this challenge that you went through in Detroit, this is going to be a worldwide challenge now for economies to, to reboost. And our wow. governments and our federal governments and our cities are going to be looking at ways that they can actually do what was done here, right? Yes, very cool, man. Yeah, this is this is like, you know, for a city, we, you know, for Detroit, man, we've been through hard times, but it's no excuse. You either die or you come back, right? And so that has been the attitude. Um, we have loved every bit of it, you know what I mean? And while Building, what I found is while building and while growing, opportunity opens up, right? When you're in the ground growing, opportunity opens up for you. And yes, man, this leads to, this leads to other stuff happening around the globe, which also led to other opportunities. Um, Let's for- talk, talk about them. So, so this was some more uh, photography around the business, was it? Is that a business? So, because I was Motor City Match photographer. I became, I became this photographer for business in the city of Detroit. And so I, more and more, I started photographing business owners in a creative way, right? Very cool, very creative, very fresh kind of way that spoke to small business because we had to innovate as a city, because I had to innovate as a uh, small business owner. This is how I portrayed the uh, business owners going forward. Right, very fresh, very cool, um, really capitalized on personalities. Um, and these became some well-known folks and people accomplishing some really, really, really cool things within the city and holding some really cool positions um, within the city. It caused my reputation to grow and put me on a level where I had people at high levels calling me to execute um, for them, companies and everything else. Plus, if you take the other side of your business, a lot of these people would have high school seniors, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so before, before we go on to what I led to next, because it's a fascinating story where this goes. But um, so if I'm a photographer and I'm in a city similar to Detroit, because I'm not going to be able to take you on in Detroit, right? But if I'm in Dublin, Ireland, yeah, and we're we're in you know the same economic mess that Detroit was ten years ago, and I'm a photographer based there, how, how would you? in this short space of time, what would you do to try and get that PR and coverage to be known as who you are today very, very quickly to take advantage of what's probably going to happen here, which is is similar, which is going to be... From a PR and marketing standpoint, I would connect myself to the things that are happening in real time right right there in Dublin. So um, if that means that the mayor is getting ready to do a program that's going to fund small business, then I need to be there and I need to uh, authentically help. So one of the things that I would that I did was I offered my services, right? Um, what was really cool is like, listen, I want to be a part of the growth and da-da-da. I'd like to offer my services and give you guys um, the footer. And then I would always throw in, I would say, listen, I know it's not there now, but if there's ever a budget, right, please consider me, right? I would get in and I would start calling and I would start talking to people, people who are in positions um, to make stuff happen, people who may potentially be running programs that are getting ready to start. I would be calling, emailing, right? Getting on their social media platforms, all of that stuff. I would be inserting myself 
into that picture. That doesn't mean that they necessarily want me there, but I don't really care. I'm going to insert myself um, into that picture, and then I'm going to find out how they operate and operate accordingly, and then authentically serve, right? There's, there, everybody has intent, and everybody wants to grow, right? And everybody is looking for opportunity. But there is this word called authentic, meaning if you're going to help, we know you want opportunity, but don't do it just for opportunity, right? Actually care about people's stuff. And if you care about people's stuff, you will make sure that it is better because you touched it. When you do that, they will automatically want to use you. People who see you delivering for their, for their thing, their their entity, right? The thing that's important to them. When you help their job be easier and you make them look good at the same time, you become their guy or their girl, right? So I would put my boots on and I would get busy talking to people. People, was, because remember, even in recession and depression, there is money out there. There is budget out there. It's just not as um, free as it used to be. So you have to find where it is, right? And then attach yourself to it. And then be, um, when you get there, make sure you deliver and deliver well. Love us. What you do, Love us. That's, what, that's what I would do. I, don't, I know that was really broad, um, but that's probably one of the first things I would do is get to talking and running your mouth and talking to people. Excellent. So make those connections. And we might be able to do it in person right now, but you know, we've got Zoom and we've got email and we've got yeah. Facebook Messenger and so just, just you know, you're, you're probably no more than three people away from that final decision maker, even if it is the mayor of the city. Absolutely. Figure out your connections. And even with social media now, you know, check out LinkedIn. LinkedIn is brilliant to find people who are connected in your locality, whether that be politically or business-wise. Ab absolutely. Matter of fact, in your neighborhood, um, there, there's probably somebody who knows somebody that is doing something really cool. Connect yourself to it. And, and, and Jeff Henderson, I don't know if you've, you've read the book for by Jeff Henderson, but he talks about the big ask, you know, don't be afraid to ask the something big, because you know what, if they say no, you're no worse off than where you were. Than where you were. No, I haven't read it, but I'm going to read it now. <laughs> right. So, so Sean, talk to us about where it went next. So it went WordPress, a well, massive, it, it, massive yeah. company, worldwide company. Yes. So here was one of those crazy ideas. Um, Hodge Fleming's um, good friend of mine. He is in one of the uh, photographs. He was one of the guys who organized the uh, Detroit's largest selfie, right? Here was this ask. So here, here we go. We see that now, um, and I, because of Detroit, what ended up happening was, is as we started to rebuild, downtown was getting everything they needed, but neighborhood small businesses were not getting what they needed. Right. And so there, there became this push for investment in small business and neighborhood businesses. So um, this crazy idea. What if it was our job to go to all of these neighborhood businesses. Right. And give them um, a website. Invest in them a website. So we started to close. The idea was to close the digital divide because literally businesses, small businesses were leaving. Um, literally small businesses were leaving trillions of dollars on the table um, because they didn't have a website. There was no way for people to digitally transact with them. You had old mom and pop stores who weren't um, relevant, right, at the time. And so we pitched this idea to WordPress and WordPress said, yeah, that's a wonderful idea. What if we went into neighborhoods and, and all of these businesses, we connected them with a website and had their um, their funding, right? Everything that had them transact so that they could actually make money and be sustainable as a business. Well, that idea went, um, went national. So we traveled to almost every state in the, uh, in the nation, putting small businesses on the grid. And I was the official photographer. It was my job to capture um, those businesses. It's really cool. That that's amazing. So um, so that led to here then, diversity reach. So this is what you're talking about. It went national. City of Los Angeles knocked on the door, right? Knocked on the door, right? And so, you know, we're photographing these neighborhood businesses, right? Los Angeles is one of those cities, and what happens is you start to have conversations 
with uh, with cities like a city of Los Angeles who needs stock photography, right? Um, and so you start looking at like stock photography. It opens up opportunity now to talk stock photography with a, with the city of Los Angeles, right? And so that's kind of where things started going, and opportunity after opportunity unfolds from so, this. So Sean, just to just to because stock photography will have maybe a different meaning for other photographers, but the story behind this is that. Los Angeles wanted to do something similar to Detroit, right? To help small businesses. But of course, for a website, you need content. That's correct. So Los Angeles then hired you to create photography of locations within Los Angeles that those business owners could use those images on their websites, right? That's correct. Yeah, rock that. Yes, sir. Ingenious. I love it. This is more of those photographs, right? More of that, yeah. Wow. So talk to us about fine new markets. You've just proven so many new markets you found. You know, I've lost my job. School photography, that's where the money is. And um, how do I create a studio? Well, I've got to do it in steps. Let's rent a studio first and then I can afford my own studio. Then let's see what can I do in my locality to lift the spirits of our community because my city's gone burst and morale is on, on the floor. That led to a new market then in, in, in Detroit within the business community that led on to then this opportunity to do the rebrand stuff in WordPress in, in Detroit, which mm -hmm. led to an opportunity to do the same thing in Los Angeles. So talk to me about find new markets. Well, it's about, it's about, well, you know, once again, you know, you can't be cute, right? When, when, when stuff like this hits COVID, Corona, right? And everybody's hurting. Um, you can't be cute. And so remember, I told you, I don't like photographing children, but I became a school photographer, right? Because it was a part of the market that could turn things around for me. And so what I'm saying to photographers is, is a be, be open-minded, right? And so if you're strictly a family photographer or a wedding photographer, maybe you need to diversify your business. Um, you need to diversify your business and look at other things that could help pay the bills. Uh, what I mean by that is diversify and find new markets in a way there are there is business. So, for example, on a municipal level where budgets are already set. So no matter what happens or what goes off, there's a budget that's already set. There's a check that can already be that's already sent and already written if you secure that business. Right. Um, find those types of markets. You may just be a wedding photographer, but for the sake of having diversity um, and making things a little bit easier for you in case of things like coronavirus where the world shuts down for three months, right? There is some diversity in that, right? Where maybe you can do photography where you don't have to socially distance, right? Maybe that's architecture. Maybe that is interiors. Maybe there's, there's a type of photography that you could do while um, quarantine is still going on that you could be approved of. Maybe that's a government contract. I don't know, right? But be open-minded. Find those sources now and lock yourself in. The more, the more um, available you are to diversify, yourself and open-minded you are, the, the, the more you'll be stable in uh, crisis situations. So I know, I know when you did my, my program in, in New Orleans, you hadn't done your Myers-Briggs at that stage and you were on it and you said, Roland, I'm a diplomat, right? <laughs> and do you remember that? So and I said, you are absolutely the diplomat. You know, you're, you're able to make those connections and get out and talk to people. But, you know, you have that positive attitude. You know, I have to make it happen. You've got to have that mindset. Yes. Two, what's the worst that can happen? Someone says no. Am I any worse off than I was before? No. You know, so let's make that happen. But you also have, and I said it earlier in our conversation, you know, you've this kind heart. Like, you sat down. I wasn't there at the time because I was prepping for, for, for my problem that was coming up. But my wife and my daughter were there. And you connected with them and you bought them lunch, you know. But... And that leads in, I think, to the next story, which I think is just shows if you are a kind person and you give to people, what can result from it, right? So mm -hmm. I'm going to call up the next slide and it'll lead into that story. But there's a connection there. What I mean is that you repeat this stuff over and over and over and over again. And I didn't have a big contract to give you. 
but you still bought me lunch, yeah, or bought my family lunch. But here's a scenario of where that kindness actually did result in some really good business. I'm going to just call up the slide on it now. I think this is a fascinating story. Rock that. Okay. <laughs> Rock so talk to me about Biggie Coffee. Bigby. So um, Bigby Coffee, man, is really cool. I have a relationship with Bigby Coffee probably for about, I don't know, 10 years now, right? So uh, I used to be almost 300 pounds. Let me tell you the backstory real quick. I used to be almost 300 pounds and I was rather unhealthy. And I would go into Bigby Coffee and sit down and do work. And I wasn't buying anything um, because I was trying to get back healthy. I wasn't buying anything because everything they had was like sugar, right? You know what I mean? And so I was like, I think I need to, if I'm going to be in here doing work, I need to do something, right? And so a uh, ba- bit of background, I think Bigby now has about 250 franchises um, uh, nationwide. Um, and they're not in every state, but they are growing at, at an amazing pace. And the owners actually spoke at TEDx Detroit, um, which I'm director of photography of, spoke at uh, TEDx Detroit this year. And so I was unhealthy and, and me and the barista behind the counter made a sugar-free, lactose-free drink. Um, and they called it the Shawnee Bear, right? So I had this relationship with Big B um, ever since then. And, e- and every time I get a chance, like when I go into a Big B store, I'll always buy the person or people in line. I'll buy their coffee or their drinks or whatever. It's, it's not unusual for me to walk in and just buy the whole store. People are sitting there doing work. I'll buy the whole store, uh, coffee or drinks. Or, because I've been blessed, right? And, and it pays to be kind. Um, well, anyway, I shot these photos of um, Detroit, and because of the relationship, um, I have a couple of mugs um, at Bigby Coffee. And so, when I did the uh, so when I did the uh, the launch of my studio, we launched the mug at the same time, and Bigby was involved with that, and I have a relationship with that. Also, Bigby is a very popular coffee spot here. Um, I do stuff with my high school seniors in Big B stores, right? So creating those partnerships is a very cool thing. Um, but what's what's happening now is that uh, this is a very cool story. So at the time, the vice president went to the Big B store that I went to all of the time. I didn't know who this guy was. He actually lived in the community. I went to the Big B store all of the time. And remember, I told you I'd buy everybody drinks. And so I walked into the Big, Big B store this one particular day. And there was this guy in line and I was like, I'm going to buy his coffee. And he was like, no, 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 dude, I'm going to buy your coffee. And I was like, no, 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 dude, I'm buying your coffee. And we were literally having this friendly fight in Big B Coffee trying to buy each other's coffee, right? And we know the feeling. I tried the same with our lunch in New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we literally did this a couple of times. I had no clue who he was. And so one day he walks up to me and he hands me, Uh, before he hands me the card, he said, man, I would love to have a conversation with you about how to change the culture of Big B. I said, what? I said, why would this guy? And he walked out. So he's like, I'm gonna go out to my car and get my card. um, And I'm gonna come back and give it to you. I said, why would this guy be talking to me about changing the culture of Big B? He He sent me to an article um, about the owners of Big B and how they changed culture of their entire, they used to treat their employees really bad, really corporate. And they started, it talked about them treating their employees like family. And it changed the culture of the whole entire company brand. Well, what ended up happening was, is that he was the vice president of Big B. I had no clue who he was, but he had been watching me for a period of time. And what that did was started a relationship and a conversation around um, me potentially photographing all of the uh, franchises um, and Big B Coffee um, around the nation. And so it is from authentically just being kind. Um, you never know who you are standing before. You never know who you are in front of, and you never know who is watching you, right? And so, um, man, that it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind, you know? It's, it's such wisdom and inspiration and gives us all hope because a lot of photographers are going i don't ha- i might not have a wedding for the rest of this year so but as you said you know start thinking outside the box start thinking about who can you connect with in your community 
find a purpose that you really believe in and go for it. And talking about purpose, can you just talk to us a little bit about the conference you run yourself called Rock That? Yes. So we have a conference called Rock That, and, and it's a, a conference that is really built around people. Um, it's a photography conference where we bring some of the best of the best to Detroit for three days of training um, and content, but it really is investment in people. What I found, what I found is that, man, people, the, the biggest, photography is not people's biggest problem, learning, right? What I found is people's biggest problem is, is that um, they discount themselves, right? And people need a community, right? You got, you got senior citizens who are retiring, they're buying a camera, they want to go into business, but they, they don't know if they can compete, right, in this world. So we surround them with a community that says, absolutely, you can. And we give them resources and we back them and we push them and we're there to catch them just in case they fall. And so we do rock that conference every year in Detroit. Um, we postponed it this year because of Corona, but it's next year, June 17th through the 19th. Uh, Ronan Ryle is going to be there. Um, we talk in business. This, what I'm very excited about is that we're about investing in people. We will be investing in Generation Z, right? Young folk, high schoolers, uh, college students, um, and prepping them to be the next generation of creative professionals in our industry of photography, money. Money is the hottest stuff on the planet. I don't care what you say, man, right? Uh, we love giving back. And there is nothing, there is no greater investment than the investment in people. People might say, well, the, some of the greatest investments you can make are in businesses, um, it's in property, um, it's in this, it's in that. No, the greatest investment you could ever make is in people. The return is absolutely amazing. And the reason I say that is, is that Ronan, one day after I'm done making money, God, you know, God willing, I'll be 90 something years old with all of this sexiness right here, right? Um, and I want to be able to hand our industry over um, to some people who know what they're doing. A young generation that can take the foundation that we leave and take it to the next level, right? So that we can be, I'm glad, and don't get me wrong, I know people will kill me and be like, you're glad? I'm glad Corona has happened and, and bankruptcy in Detroit and all of that stuff, not because of the pain that it's caused, but because it challenges us to become better right? It challenges us to invest in people, um, become stronger, become wiser, because the only way we're going to get out of stuff is to, is to educate ourselves, to invest in people, work hard, put boots on the ground. And when we grow out of it, we grow out of it better and stronger. I, I hear what you're saying, Sean, and, and no one wants Corona, but what I will do is I think it's giving a it's bringing humanity back to a lot of society. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. bonds are being created and people are, you know, that the rat race piece where people chase money and all that, I think it's causing people to reflect and rethink what's really important in life. Yeah. And, you know, I've been at a lot of, a lot of conferences, not just in our industry, but in other industries. You know, I've never ever seen a conference where so much of the time actually goes into feeding the poor in the locality. Oh, you know, yeah. That shows true purpose. Can, can we just finish on that point? Because I think it's a really important point to show that when you have a purpose and you clearly have a purpose, it's coming out in everything you do. It literally, that's what happens to it. It, it, got, has, it permutates naturally through absolutely everything you do and ends up in doing stuff like at a conference, just tell us what, what you do on one of the days. Yeah, so the Rock That Conference, it, it, there's so much to it. So, But the Rock That Conference, we uh, partner with um, the Neighborhood Service Organization, which is an organization that serves Detroit's homeless population. And they've been around for years and they do a phenomenal job um, at that. As a, as a conference, I, I wanted to make it a point for us to invest in society and community. So as a conference, every year we... Um, we feed the homeless and we put together care packs. And so the neighborhood service organization has a building of apartments for about 160 residents. And they help them through transition from um, homelessness to get them skill set to be able to live in society, right, uh, successfully. Well, we cater, we cater in brunch for 160 residents of the NSO Bell Building every single year. We spare no expense. 
Um, it is a very, very, very nice catered brunch. We sit down with them. We have a blast. There's music. And we do care packs for they, they have a, a center called the uh, Sheila Clay um, Center, which is their crisis center. So we do care packs uh, up to 300 every year for them. And we do that as a give back. Um, and that's, that's what the conference does um, as a give back to community and society. And the reason that I do that is because um, I've been invested in. Uh, I have the only reason that I am here and the only reason that I exist is because people look past my mediocrity and invested in me, right? And so um, for me, that is core, you know? And I happen to be a photographer and photography is what I do and I love it and it is my art and it is my business and it is how I make money. At the end of the day, we serve people. And so that is, that is the mission of Sean Lee and that's the mission of Rock Day. Sean Lee, all I can say is you are the most human, genuine person I've ever met. You are a true leader in our industry. I love you so much from the moment I met you three years ago. Keep up all the great work and thank you so much for being in the Think Tank. I know you're a lighthouse, an inspiration and a wisdom for so many people out there. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Rona. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day, great afternoon, and a great evening. Bye for now.